we're in 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses, um, actually 5 through 9, but we're going to back up today, and we're going to look at verses 3 through 9 as we read to get the background and remind you of where we were last week. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that's in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness. Verse 7, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he, has, he was cleansed from his former sins. And may God add his blessing at the reading of his word this morning. Well, as we think about these very important qualities that we're going to look at today, and we think about our Christian walk, it says there early on that we have been given a divine power that's been granted to us who know Christ as Savior. When we receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us, as we talked about last week, and he gives us all the resources and the means possible to live out this Christian life. And he's going to extrapolate or, or expand on this this week as he talks about how the difference between trying to do it in our human ability versus in the power of the resurrection that we have in Jesus Christ. But we realize that building character is a matter of drudgery. And I was reading this week in my devotions, My Utmost for His Highest by Oswald Chambers. He talks about that building character is something we do one habit, one step, one day at a time. He said, drudgery is the test of genuine character, Oswald Chambers said. The greatest hindrance in our spiritual life is that we will only look for big things to do. He says, yet Jesus took a towel and began to wash the disciples' feet, John chapter 13. It's difficult for us to do the adding that Peter mentioned here. We say that we do not expect God to take us to heaven on flowery beds of ease, and yet we act as if that is what we want God to do. I must realize, he said, that my obedience, even in the smallest detail of life, has all of the omnipotent power of the grace of God behind it. If I will do my duty, not for duty's sake, but because I believe God is engineering my circumstances, then at the very point of my obedience, all of the magnificent grace of God is mine through the glorious atonement of the cross of Christ. God builds character in our lives through the routines and the habits of our lives. At times, he brings unexpected interruptions and circumstances, and he uses those interruptions to build character deeper into our lives. But really, when we see the trials and tribulations come, it's really revealing the character that's already been built. It's kind of like a wine press. When the grapes are squeezed, then you see the beautiful grape juice that eventually will become wine come out of it. Much like an Olympic athlete, we know we think about all the work that goes into it year after year of training. Some of these people started when they were very small. They got up early in the morning before school and did gymnastics or whatever it was they did. They were on a strict diet. They probably hired a coach at some point. And they spent years and years and years trying to perfect their skill. They lost a lot of competitions before they got to be a part of the Olympic team and then to be able to compete in front of the whole world. Think about all that they went through. They developed deep character and commitment in their lives. So it is with our character. Trials and tribulations bring out our true character. And it's on full display as we deal with the heartaches and the challenges in our lives. That's why doing laundry faithfully brings honor and glory to God. Dad, mowing your grass, taking care of the cars, doing the things around the house that can all be done as a good steward to honor and glorify God. Kids doing schoolwork, it's much more than to please your teacher and to get a good grade. It's more than finding affirmation and encouragement from your parents, but you're doing it to be a lifelong learner to please and honor and glorify your heavenly father. So 
Let's supplement or add to our saving faith by sharpening and enhancing what the Holy Spirit has already placed within us. First thing on your outline is supplementing your faith. Supplementing your faith. How many in this room take supplements? I do. Fish oil, CoQ10. I got a long list of things when I go to the doctor to give them all the supplements I take. Hopefully they're doing what they're supposed to do. I don't know, but it keeps you healthy, I believe. Well, he's talking about some spiritual supplements here that we need to add to our faith. Look at verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to su supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly, brotherly affection with love. I want you to think about that, that each word placed in Scripture is put there for a reason. That's why we wade into the scriptures week after week, slowly and carefully to interpret them and clarify what the author is pointing out and what he wants to get across to the reader as we understand it by God's Holy Spirit. Then when we understand it, we're to respond in worship and then we're to apply these truths in obedience to our life. Notice what he says there in verse five, the first four words, for this very reason. He's saying because of all the precious and magnificent promises in verses 3 and 4 that he talked about, because of the divine nature that God has imparted to us as Christ followers, we're to live a life of godly behavior. All the resources we need to do that are at our disposal. Again, you and I, we cannot live up to God's standard on our own. And what is that standard? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, he says, You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And of course, no human being can do that. In 1 Peter 1.15, Peter said, But as you, he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. And that's a quote from the Old Testament as well. We serve a holy God, but we're sinners saved by grace. And then we're empowered by that Holy Spirit. That's why we have to be partakers of the divine nature. Peter goes on to say in verse 5, make every effort to su supplement your faith. Some versions of the Bible use the term add to your faith. This is talking about that we need to make the maximum effort to equip ourselves with these specific virtues that are rooted in our saving faith. These character qualities take root and continue to grow in our walk with Christ as we fully depend upon God to provide. It is understood with this phrase that we must bring ourselves to the table. God brings the resources, but we have to go and partake and receive these resources. We've said that God does the saving, but we have the human responsibility to work alongside God in the process of becoming more like Christ. Paul said it this way in Philippians chapter 3. Remember, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was uh, blameless before he was a believer in Christ, but then he realized when he saw the law and understood who Christ was, he received Christ. And he said this in Philippians 3, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already made perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then he says this, he says, let those of you who are mature think this way, and if, any, if in anything you think otherwise, God reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. He said, I'm not perfect yet. I'm on the road. I'm trying to do everything I can to press toward the goal to be like Jesus Christ. But he's encouraging us to realize in our maturity, we need to trust in God to help us to be able to do that. And Peter closed out this great book, 2 Peter 3.18, the key verse of the book, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That grow there is a continual growth. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So I can't emphasize this enough. Use what God has given to you. The word supplement is a very interesting word here. In the Greek, it means choir master or choir director. And in these days, in the Romans and the Greeks, 
they had some very wealthy musical philanthropists who wanted to have wonderful music for people to come and events to see in public. And so this choir master, choir director, this word used here means that he not only provided the resources, but he lavishly provided the resources. He brought the very best to the table because he wanted the best for his uh, singers, but also for the audience that would be there. Literally, the leader of the choir poured out and provided. Later, a prefix was added to the front of this word that gave it the meaning of someone who provides for an army. Peter spiritualizes this idea. He takes this Greek word and redefines it in spiritual terms. He says this is that God equips the soul and gives Christ followers everything necessary to develop the Christ-like character qualities in our lives. Then 2 Corinthians 9.10 it says, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Think about that. The farmer is given seed and God is the one who provides the soil, the rain, the sun, and all the things to bring it to fruition, to bring it to harvest. The supplier stands by his product and supports it all the way to the harvest. So I hope... I know I've used a lot of repetition and hyperbole here, but I hope you get the point in these first sermons in Peter that we have everything at our disposal to successfully live the Christian life through the Holy Spirit. So then we move on to the third section there of verse 5. It's a symphony of God's grace, these, these character qualities. I played in orchestra, bassoon, clarinet, and uh, you know as you begin, you tune up, and then everybody knows their parts, everybody plays at the appropriate time, and it makes a beautiful symphony or a song within the orchestra. Well, these things all come together to make a beautiful symphony of grace as we learn to grow these qualities in our life. First of all, the first one is virtue, virtue or moral excellence. You'll see moral excellence in some translations. It means a divinely given ability that fulfills its designated purpose. The idea of virtue here is one who is a moral hero that excels in heroic courage, producing in people qualities that are Christ-like. This is reaching the highest level of integrity and uh, honesty and compassion. This is the highest of the virtues he's talking about. These are acts and deeds that encompass the most outstanding qualities in someone's life. The Romans had a saying, to flee from vice is the beginning of virtue. This is a nice thing to say, but it would have been wonderful if it would have been actually possible. But the ancient philosophers who knew better could never do better. Seneca was one of the great Roman philosophers of his day, but his life was anything but moral as he assisted Nero in murder plots and eventually he committed suicide. Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, insisted that the measure of all philosophy is whether one could live by it. But he died from syphilis that made him go insane. By far the most interesting attempt to virtue was Benjamin Franklin. When he was 20 years old, Benjamin Franklin drew up a list of 13 virtues that he believed every man should strive to attain. Here's what they were. Temperance, which would be self-control, silence, order, Resolution, frugality, industry, sincerity, justice, moderation, cleanliness, tranquility, chastity, and humility. He even made a little chart where he would uh, keep it going, and if he failed in one of those, he would put a check mark beside it. But try as he might, Franklin fell far short of his goals, as he said in his autobiography. No doubt his life was better for having tried, but he realized the fact of moral virtue is impossible for human beings. You can't do it in and of yourself. In 2 Corinthians 5.9, Paul said, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. It's through the power of the Spirit that we're able to please him and to carry out and have these virtues in our life. The second one would be knowledge. Knowledge. And, you know, this is a word that we'll see over and over again in this book, and he's already talked about it in the first few verses. But he's talking about spiritual knowledge that's acted upon. As Christ followers study the truth of scriptures illumined by the Holy Spirit, 
It leads to understanding and brings with it spiritual discernment or wisdom. You see, knowledge is the collection of facts and information. Wisdom is positively doing what's good based on those facts, acting out on the facts that you've uh, encountered in your life. Colossians 3.10, and says, And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of the creator. That's why Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So to experience God, to learn from the word, and then to act upon him with godly behavior is knowledge. The third one, self-control. Self-control. To hold oneself in, it means to control the passions, the desires of our flesh. Now, it's not wrong to fulfill the desires of our flesh as long as it's done in a righteous manner. We're all made as human beings with the desire to have food, a desire to sleep, a desire to survive, a drive to have sex. That's all part of who God made us to be. But it is when we desire to step out of the boundaries of Scripture to fulfill them and harm the temple of the Holy Spirit, we move into sin in our lives. And so we need to rely on Scripture and the Holy Spirit to restrain those desires and seek to fulfill them in a way that pleases God. Sexuality is great. It's an honorable thing, according to the writer of Hebrews. Sexuality within the confines of marriage between a man and a woman. Food is to be eaten in moderation. We're to be careful with uh, drinking alcohol or taking illegal drugs or overusing prescription drugs. Those things bring harm to the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is your body. Paul lays this out in 1 Corinthians 6. He said, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin, is a per- Every other sin is a-, a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And then he says this, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? And then he says, you are not your own, for you are bought with a price, the price of Jesus' blood on the cross. So glorify God in your body. If you know Christ is your Savior, you are a temple, and everywhere you go, you you represent Christ. You have the Holy Spirit living within you. And that's something to to always be thinking about wherever you go. Think of the athlete we talked about before in the introduction. All that goes into making them successful, as successful as they can be, they exhibit tremendous self-control. You and I, we're running the marathon of the Christian life. We're to be just as disciplined as those athletes are as we run for Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. When you watch the Summer Olympics and you watch the track athletes, and they take off their warm-ups, and they have skin-tight clothing, they do everything they can to be as light as possible when they run. They don't run with ankle weights. They don't run with anything else that might encumber them. And so we need to lay aside every weight, every obstacle in our life. Verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The next one will be steadfastness. Another term we could say is perseverance. You see that also in other translations, steadfastness. This is the ability to endure difficult things. Another way of saying it is patient endurance in doing what is right. I love that. Patient endurance in doing what is right, even when everything's going wrong, even when everything in your life is chaotic, even when you feel like that somebody put you in the dryer and turned the dryer on and you're tumbling around. Patient endurance throughout that time. William Barclay, a commentator, says this, it is the courageous acceptance of everything life can do to us and the transmuting of even the worst event into another step on the upward way. As you go through these difficulties, these heartaches, these these trials and tribulations, look as another stepping stone to make you more like Jesus Christ. In Luke 8, 15, as we think of the parable of the sower, sowing seed in the four soils, This little verse talks about 
the good soil that received the seed. Jesus said, as for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast and honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. You know, when that farmer puts his uh, seeds in the ground in April or whenever it is, he has to wait a long time for harvest, doesn't he? He has to really trust God for the sun and the right amount of moisture and, and that the weeds won't come in and overtake his crop and all the things that go into it. So we have to have that same kind of patience as God is growing the seed of himself in our lives. Steadfastness. Then we move to godliness. Godliness. This is seeking to do God's will as he does. He's, this person seeks the welfare of others, not just for himself. One who shows reverence to both God and man. And he or she properly honors and adores God. 1 Timothy Chapter 4, verse 8, he's, Paul said, For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So we see that the first five character qualities listed are all about inward traits, inward character qualities, motives, attitudes. But the last two we're going to look at, brotherly affection and love, deal strictly with the outward display of what the inner character already has at the seat of our emotions, at our heart. So the next one's brotherly affection. Brotherly affection. This is the action of being godly. It's looking out with agape love. Agape love is that love that comes from God and is poured out on us through the Holy Spirit. It's looking out and seeing the needs and also building relationships with other people around us especially those who are followers of Christ. This love is flowing because of our vertical relationship from God to the horizontal flow to the fellow man and woman that we intersect with in our lives. No matter the depth of relationship, whether they're just merely an acquaintance that you talk to as a cashier at the grocery store or at a gas station, or whether it's someone that you know more casually, you run into every week at the why, or it's someone you work in the workplace with, or even your closest friends. It includes all those showing brotherly affection to all levels of those in relationship with each other. In Romans 13, 8, Paul said, I love this. He says, oh, no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Owe no man anything. Pay off all your debts. But the one thing you do owe them is love, to love one another. Hebrews 6.10 says, For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you've shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. God loves to see his people loving others, being a loving person like he's a loving father to us. And lastly, that leads us to that word love. That word love. This is the crowning character quality of the Christ follower's progress on the journey to spiritual maturity. This is agape love, as we said, the love that only comes from God. It's a deliberate desire for the highest good for the one loved. I always think of it this way, giving of ourselves to someone without expecting anything in return. That's pure love. Jesus said that this kind of love is the sign of a true believer. In John 13, 35, you're very familiar with this. He says, by this, all people, all people, believers, non-believers, will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Remember that to love God means we also love the people God has created that bears his image. The symphony of grace begins with faith and ends in love. The world may try to emulate some of these character qualities in their humanists, but they fall short because their goal in their humanity is to bring glory to themselves. Only through the Holy Spirit can you truly exemplify these character qualities through the resurrection power given to us that unleashes the ability to grow these qualities in our life. Romans 8.29 tells us what our destiny, what our goal is, what God's goal for us is. He says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. 
He wants to make us as much like Jesus Christ in our personality, in our motives, in our attitudes, in the way we carry ourselves, as much like Christ as we possibly can in this life. So our application, which of the supplements do you need to increase the dosage of to be more fruitful? More fruitful. Take those supplements, you go to the doctor, you hear a lot of times good reports. It's the same way here. What supplements do we need to increase the dosage of to be more fruitful? Well, as we look at verses 8 and 9, we see that as we supplement our faith, like putting miracle grow on your tomato plants like I did, you grow it and it speeds up your growth. It speeds up your growth. If you supplement these things in your spiritual life, you're going to become more and more like Jesus quickly. It'll speed up your growth. In verse 8, of 2 Peter 1, it says, For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to have a fruitful faith, a fruitful faith. The true believer in Christ possesses these qualities, and they're evidenced in his or her life by our motives, our actions, and our attitudes. Notice these two words in verse 8 are yours. The idea here is someone owning property and taking care of it. Much like a farmer nurtures his his soil before, during, and after the seed is doing its work, leading to a successful harvest. We have to nurture these traits and allow them to grow. Notice it also says, are increasing. That means possessing more than enough, even too much of something. Growing stronger and becoming more evident in our lives, these qualities are at work. I think of this passage in Exodus 36 as I thought of this verse. The story was Moses was asking the Israelites to provide money to build the tabernacle, to build the sanctuary, the portable uh, thing that they had to worship and they carried around in the wilderness. And guess what? They came to a place where they had more than enough Wouldn't that be amazing if a church said, no more money, we don't need any more offerings? This is what happened in Exodus 36. He said, so Moses gave command and word was proclaimed throughout the camp. Let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing for the material they had was sufficient to do all the work and more. And as we grow in Christ and we tap into those resources, We have more than enough to make us fruitful. It says we don't want to be ineffective or useless. This means that we are never to become inactive. We're not to be idle. We're not not to quit serving the Lord or not loving people. The seven churches in Revelation, Jesus had a blessing for each of them, but he also pointed out an area that they needed to work on. And the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2 Jesus said, but I have this against you that you've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. When they became believers in Christ, they were excited. They were filled with joy. They probably went out and they couldn't wait to tell people about how Christ had transformed their lives. They were excited to serve. But over time, apathy set in. Life came along. And they kind of lost that first love. And he's admonishing them to go back and remember those times and live with that joy, that purpose, that happiness that you first had. Unfruitful or barren. If we're unfruitful or barren, he says, leading to unbelief and little evidence of the spiritual life. John 15 tells us that the natural thing that happens as Christians is that we bear fruit. He says, I'm the vine, my heavenly father's the branch. And I bear fruit because I abide I abide in the tree, in the source, in the resources that come for me. Sometimes God has to prune back the bush to, again, bear more fruit in our lives. But we abide in him like a branch is connected to the trunk of the tree and receives that nutritious uh, resource to help them to grow leaves and expand and grow longer the branches. As we abide in Christ, we naturally should show evidence of spiritual life going on in our service for the Lord. It's a natural outflow of our experiencing and growing in the knowledge of Christ to see the evidence of these things. So have a fruitful faith, but lastly, don't have a feckless faith. A feckless faith. 
2 Peter 1.9, for whoever lacks these qualities, if you're not building these things into your life, if you're not reading the word and allowing the Holy Spirit to grow these things, whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Peter's talking here to true Christ followers who have become carnal Christians. Now, what is a carnal Christian? A carnal Christian, according to Paul, is someone who came to faith in Christ and was serving him, but at some point, whatever happened, they began to live like the world, and they turned away from God, and they were backslidden. They're separated from him because they're living for the world or for the flesh. That doesn't mean they've lost their salvation. God is going to call them in his kindness, Romans 2, 4, kindness to draw him them back to repentance. 1 Corinthians 3 describes it this way, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you still of the flesh. That's a picture, Paul saying, of what a carnal person is. And if you and I are not growing in our walk with Christ and growing in these character qualities, then we become, as it says in verse 9, they're nearsighted or myopic Christians. We become focused on what we can get out of the Christian life instead of seeing the big picture, to worship and to do all for God's glory. We battle with this in the flesh. We want at times to do our own thing, to take control of our own lives, to be selfish just for a little while or maybe longer. I get it. I battle with these things, these desires as well. Peter goes on to say that if we're in this condition, we're blind to God's truth. We're not able to discern true, our true spiritual condition. We've forgotten the blessing and the benefits of a clear conscience with God and our fellow man and woman. And we're cleansed. It says we forget that we're cleansed in this verse it means to be purified like water that's boiled when we have to have a boil order. We purify it. First John 1, 7 says, but if we walk in the light as Christ is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's a good marker to measure ourselves. Are we walking consistently in the light? Peter's warning us not to become a carnal Christian because a carnal Christian looks and acts like the world and stays for a period of time in their sin. Ron Hutchcraft, I love this, this uh, saying he has. See, he says, and the sad reality is that sin always takes you further than you ever thought you'd go, keeps you longer than you ever thought you'd stay, and costs you more than you ever thought you'd pay. There's so much truth in that. Satan, he makes everything look like a shiny, beautiful gift. And once we get involved, we don't realize the trap, the snares that are within it. I think about our phones. Just think about how close we are to pornography, one click. You just think maybe one click won't hurt anything. Or flirting with someone we should not be flirting with. Or neglecting our family because we have a particular hobby or we're engrossed in our jobs too much. Or maybe going to a party where you know you will end up out of control. All the time saying to yourself, I can handle it, but we can't. So our application is this. How is the quality of your spiritual fruit tasting that you are producing? How is the quality of the spiritual fruit that you have? How does it taste? If we look at what the Word of God says, how does it match up with what God says? In Matthew chapter 7, we love to point out in verse 1, it says, Judge not, lest you be also judged. And that's a very important verse. But then later on in that same chapter, Jesus said this, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. You and I, we have to be personal fruit inspectors with the Holy Spirit, with the word of God. But you start with your own heart. You look at your own backyard, first of all, and evaluate your fruits. I close with this illustration. A vanilla shake is one of life's simple pleasures, especially on a hot summer day. Did you know that vanilla traces its origins all the way back to a 12-year-old slave boy living on a tiny island in the Indian Ocean? Vanilla is now the most popular spice in the world, but in 1841, 
the world produced fewer than 2,000 vanilla beans all in Mexico. Up until the mid-19th century, vanilla orchids were pollinated, especially by a particular type of bee in Mexico. Over the years, as demand arose, attempts were made to industrialize this pollination process to no avail. Vanilla was stubborn, but all this changed quickly because of the ingenuity of a 12-year-old slave named Edmund Albias. He was on a small island 500 miles east of Madagascar. He was uneducated, yet he managed to solve one of the greatest botanical mysteries of the 19th century. In 1822, a plantation owner on that island of Reunion was granted some vanilla plants from the French government. Only one of them survived in nearly two decades. 20 years later, it had not yet produced any fruit. Without that bee pollinator, no one outside Mexico could get their plants to flower. That is until Edmund worked his magic. The owner was walking with, his, with uh, Edmund through the plantation in 1841 when he discovered, much to his surprise, that his vanilla vine had produced two beans. That's when Edmund revealed him very matter-of-factly that he had pollinated them using his hand. The disbelieving plantation owner asked for a demonstration, so Edmund gently pinched the pollen-bearing anther and the pollen-receiving stigma between his thumb and index finger, and thus pollinating the seed. In 1858, Reunion was, ex was exporting two tons of vanilla. In 1867, it was 20 tons. In 1898, it was 200 tons tons, and it all traces back to a 12-year-old uneducated slave boy who figured out the simple way to pollinate a vanilla vine. From that simple vine, in that single vine, a billion-dollar industry was created for vanilla. Think about the fruit. Think about the effort that that guy had to make to figure it out for himself. God wants us to bear fruit into our lives and bear it in increasing ways. Here's some questions to ponder as we close. What can you do to prune and sharpen one character quality from this passage this week? Look at those, that list of seven and pick one of those things that God is prompting you with his Holy Spirit to say, you know, I need to sharpen. I need to, to work on this particular area. You know, whether it be self-control, whether it be knowledge, living out what I already know. Have you taken time to reflect on the fruit of your labors? And if so, what do you see? How do you avoid developing spiritual amnesia that makes you unfruitful? That's a battle that we all need to face. That we need to be reminded all over and over again of what God has done in the past to build on our faith for the future. So our key thought is this. By leaning on God's promises and the power of the Holy Spirit, we supplement our faith so it continues to produce the fruit that God takes pleasure in. And that should be the goal of our Christian life. Leaning on his promises. We have the divine nature within us. The magnificent promises, as he said in verse 3 of this chapter, the power of the Holy Spirit to continue to produce the fruit that God takes pleasure in. Let's bow our heads and our hearts together. And as we do, and as we get ready to pray in just a moment, in the quietness of this moment, I encourage you just to look into your heart and your life. Is there anything God is prompting you to do this week to work on an area, a character quality that we talked about? That you would make a commitment, say, Lord, this week I want to sharpen. I want to, to increase in this area whether it be self-control, whether it be knowledge, whether it be virtue, whatever it may be, love. Let God speak to you for just a moment. And if God's speaking to you about a particular area of your life, no one's looking around, I encourage you just to raise your hand so I could pray for you. Is God prompting you? Yes. Anyone else? The God's saying yes. An area in my life that I need to Sharp it to work on. Yes. Anyone else? Numerous hands. Yes. Let's pray. Father, if we're all honest and we look into the mirror of your perfect law of the word, there are always things that we need to grow in and improve on. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that prompts us and shows us what those things are. That, Lord, you're just spurring us on, much like a, a rider on a horse with the spurs, is spurring the horse on. Your Holy Spirit spurs us on to be more like you. Even when we get tired, even when we feel like giving in, 
Even when we look around us and we see the chaos of this world, it's, it's easy to just want to sit back and relax. But Lord, thank you for this passage from Peter that you help us to encourage us to continue to become more and more like Jesus Christ. Be with each one that raised their hand this week and help them to see growth and to increase in the area that they've identified this week and throughout the weeks to come. We pray and ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.